Hi, I am Kathy Sipple. I'm your host of CoThrive Community. We are a podcast that looks at thriving systems that are working across the globe. And today with me, I have as my guest, Robert Jalmerson. Robert is a trained economist and has taught ecological economics. In 2007, he wrote the book, The Flow of Money and Spiritual Energy soon hopefully to be available translated into English, which is not his uh, native language, although he speaks it quite well. Nowadays, he works as a property owner and a business angel, and with, he's got to focus on sustainable investment. So together with his wife, he holds classes in spiritual and personal development, and he is also a grandfather of three. So thank you so much for being my guest today, Robert. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, so you are coming to us today from Sweden, and tell us yes. the name of your town where you live. <laughs> it's Eskilstuna. Eskilstuna. Yeah, and good. <laughs> yeah, great. And I, I know you've got so many interests that we actually share in common with, you know, the environment and energy and economics. And I just want to give you, you know, free reign to basically talk about all of those things in whatever <laughs> level of detail you'd like. Yeah. But of course, um, you know, for me to find somebody who is talking about the environment, you know, ecology, and, you know, um, economics, that's, there are not too many people that I know that are in that niche. So I wonder no. if you could just share a little bit about how you came to be interested in that intersection of those two well, things. Yeah, to me, I think it was, uh, when I started studying economics, I I immediately felt that the basis that, that it was built on wasn't that solid. So I was very curious as to how that, that, ground, that the ground was, how it was constructed and how it could have been constructed if you, we would have used another framework. So that was my interest from the start when I started studying economics and I, so, so that's where my, I think that's where my interest started when it came to economics and how, and the view that economics has on the world. And I think it's very uh, important to our society to know these foundations because we've built so much of our society on the foundations that are stipulated by economics. So in this respect, I've, and since then I've, I've been very curious still looking for these alternative ways of looking at economic sustainability and how we can see these things in a, in a different light than what our current society is doing. And so, because there are so many flaws to uh, economics as a science and uh, so much there to do. That's one. So that's where, I'm, that's where I come from in this respect, I think. Okay, great. Well, that is very much in alignment with, you know, what I have seen in my own life and what I have uh, learned. But I'm just curious, what are some of the, the major flaws that you, you see with the economic system that most people accept as the way things are? Yeah, well, uh, to start with, I think it's just the view of, of man. And, and we use the noun man here, because that is how it's used in economics. Otherwise, we would have maybe use some other noun like woman or something, but economics always uses man and that's symptomatic, I think, to the science as well. Uh, so the view of man is that we're basically egotistic and just looking for self-fulfillment from a very narrow point of view. Uh, and oh, if we just start by that part, that's that part is self-reinforcing, of course, as is, uh, economics has been uh, become a very powerful science and it has uh, been introduced to the politicians and they look at this and they think that people should act this way. And what, what happens as this runs a few hundred years is that people start acting as the science has uh, pre prescribed. So we get a system that is self-reinforcing when it comes to egotistic behavior. So that is one of the main flaws. And, and the other main flaw is looking at the world uh, as it's not full. So we could have a world where there's endless growth. And uh, anyone who is not a trained economist could 
easily understand that this is not possible. We cannot grow the economy in infinitely. We, some, there has to be a limit to growth. Uh, but the econom, uh, economics as a science never always looks past this and say, that, well, it's always possible to keep growing. Uh, and there's been attempts within economics to decouple growth from, from material use and things like that, but it, it never works because as the economy is growing, we're also using uh, more materials and putting and having more, uh, putting more stuff in the environment uh, all the time. So uh, yeah, so, so this is a, a really a big flaw too. Yeah. Well, I am totally on board with that. I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen that video, the story of stuff, but I that, think I have. Yes. <laughs> that was kind of a good one where it's like, it just doesn't make sense if we keep extracting all these minerals and other substances from the earth and just keep making stuff that's designed basically to break, you know, as you said, it's, it's just this self-fulfilling, you know, system that is just meant to propel consumerism and it, it doesn't yeah. really work very well for the humans or for the earth. So I, I also know that you, wrote your book with a process that you call inspired writing. Is that, yeah. is that correct? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. And so I'm, I'm really curious if you could tell listeners a little bit about how, how that worked for you or did, you know, was it the earth that was speaking to you or, or what, where do you think the inspiration came from? I, I would say actually that the, the inspiration would come from directly from the earth. It was more of a spiritual process. Mm -hmm. So it, it came more from higher realms, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but I, in, in the way it worked for me was that uh, I just have had to write, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, neglect that feeling because I couldn't go to sleep if, if I didn't write for, you know, maybe half an hour and then I could leave it and go to sleep. So, so that's, but, but to me, this was more, uh, channeled from from higher realms than channeled directly from from the earth, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that. Well, to me, it, I think that process of channeling directly from the earth would be more difficult. I think it's easier to find, or at least for me, it's easier to find uh, spiritual realms and uh, spiritual beings that has this knowledge that they want to convey to us who are living on earth so uh, to me that's an easier way to to get contact well i can't wait until this is available for us in english-speaking um, countries and i know you're working on that and i have even said i would help you <laughs> yes. with that and i'm very grateful for that that would be great <laughs> yeah i liked what i read so far a uh, little snippet but I, I wonder if you could um you know obviously not share the whole content of the book but can you share maybe some of the highlights about, you know, what's covered or just a few of your favorite takeaways that you got from that, what I'm going to call divine download? Yeah. Well, I think to, to me, it's like uh, knowing the knowledge that we, our energy system is very much connected to how we experience our own personal economy. Uh, so the the book works very much with this. If you have a block in some some part of your energy system, it will reflect in how you experience uh, your own economy. Uh, and there there'll be if there are blocks, you would experience lack in a certain area. And uh, and of course, the goal then to to your personal life would be to feel abundance. Now, but then it's important to remember that abundance is more of an inner feeling than an actual amount of money. Because so much of what we're being taught is that if you get this sum of money, you could, you know, you would be prosperous. But if you look at people around you, you would often feel find that people who have a lot of money, they don't feel like they've been living an abundant life. 
whereas people who have less money can find that they live an abundant life. So in this respect, it's very important to find this inner feeling of abundance and reinforcing that. And also to remember that people have different life paths. Not everyone is supposed to be a millionaire and everyone isn't supposed to have this grand economy for themselves. But still, given my life purpose, it's always important and very much, uh, and very important for your well being to get this feeling of abundance within your own life. So, and as your energy system is in tune with your economy, you would feel this abundance. So that is the main focus on the book. How can we find this, uh, this inner feeling of abundance and how can that strengthen also our relationship to our personal economy? So that's, that's the main parts. And also another part is as we're living in this modern economy, we're also... Uh, we've also been taught to fight with one another for energy. And in this fight, we forget the actual energy source. So in this, in this respect, we're, we're like a tree with, with no roots and no leaves because <laughs> we don't take in the energy from, from the ground and not from above either, but we're more taught to take the energy from from others or, other, or like, like a forest, if the trees would be competing for energy amongst each other instead of sucking up the water from the ground and taking the light from the sky. That is how our economy or how we're taught to work within our, within our modern economy. So that's also a very important part of feel, feeling self-sustainable when it comes to energy and being able to find these sources of energy. Because that's also, of course, what's building up the energy of the chakra system. Mm -hmm. It's filled up from, from above and it's filled up from the ground. And we need both this pole, these, these poles to, to fill the energy. So that's, yeah, that's a very important part of the book, I think. Well, I, I love that. And I think I've shared with you that I've spent quite a lot of time in forest myself and I've yeah. been getting some divine downloads about, um, you know, economy as well, which is interesting. Um, so w one thing that came to me, and I'm curious if this was similar for you, is that, you know, back to the tree analogy, instead of trees taking from one another, I know in science, um, recently there have been some breakthroughs. I'm thinking specifically of Suzanne Samard and British Columbia, she was able to show how trees were actually sharing nutrients through their roots. So not extracting them from one another, but a mother tree would kind of nurse her, her nursery, you know, in the yeah. forest and share nutrients through the, um, the roots and the mycorrhizal fungus network as well. And I just thought that was great. They would also use that system to warn one another about predators that were coming. Have you encountered that at all, or did that factor? Yeah, in? yeah I, 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 I don't remember the name, but I know of a German guy who's been writing a book on this as well. So yeah, uh, I think I read that one too. Like the secret life of trees, maybe. Yes, was exactly. That, yeah, that was right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so I think there's a lot to this, and we're mm -hmm. we're still. I think it's very interesting that these findings come come up at this time because this is what we need as humanity needs to learn these things how to nurture ourselves and to share and now we're finding that that the trees in the woods are doing this already and they can teach us how do we do this so i think it's very interesting with this analogy and how and also for us collectively how we uh, we're moving in this direction we're starting to learn, even though we're, even though you know, on a collective level, of course, we're still very stuck in this system thinking that 
that the, uh, the economist has brought on us. Well, since you mentioned collective, I, I realize I kind of left out an important part of your introduction, which is how we know each other. So <laughs> yeah. I backtrack a little bit and talk about this collective that we're kind of helping to birth. Is, is, would that be okay? Absolutely. So back Great. in mid-February, Robert and I, along with a couple dozen other people, entered a program that was called the Evolutionary Ambassador Academy with our teacher, friend, and mentor, Barbara Marks Hubbard. And um, you know, she was in her 80s, she was almost 90, um, you know, but just the picture of health and full of, full of vigor. And we were in the middle of this class with her and then she ended up passing away partway through the program. And so the idea behind the program was that we would become ambassadors of Barbara's work, which was about conscious evolution. And I think what has been really lovely for me to see is that there's been this real knitting together um, of relationships that we, we want to take it beyond the 12 week program and kind of cast a net out there to help other people get into this, you know, I don't want to call it a fast track. It's whatever speed is right for you, but <laughs> into this, you know, conscious evolution that allows us to evolve, you know, as, as a planet together. It's, yeah. There are different sectors. It's kind of hard to capsulize everything that Barbara taught in such a short time, but environment um, and economy, those are two, two of the sectors. And Barbara started back in the seventies, I believe it was, and continued into the eighties, something that she called syncons, or that was short yes. for synergistic convergence. So now that we have the ability to meet online and share, you know, um, stories like this across the uh, internet, we can almost have syncons anytime. So this is a little mini syncon or Barbara yeah. also had something that she called joining genius and genius in my estimation, doesn't require you to have any certain, you know, number of IQ. It's just, what is your particular knowledge? What is your genius to share? And so I just feel like we're honoring lots of parts of that teaching when we come together and have this conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. And so one of the uh, metaphors that seem to keep coming out, at least in the pockets of um, the groups I was hanging out with, is this metaphor of a blanket um, sort of enveloping the world, like the, uh, the noosphere, if you will, that was, um, you know, patches of consciousness in each of these different areas. And um, I, this is a pretty lofty goal, but it, it's kind of in my mind that if we have enough conversations and we connect enough dots by way of, you know, dropping names, and I mean that in the nicest possible way, or resources, <laughs> that somebody yeah. listening to this could follow that thread and then pick it up in their part of the world and say, oh, great, you know, hey, Kathy and Robert started this thread and they mentioned these other tools or, hey, I know somebody that Robert needs to speak with or that Kathy should interview. Yeah. And that sooner or later, we not literally, because I guess there won't literally be a blanket, but we'll have, you know, you could, you could connect the threads all over the world that would be talking about the different conversations that we need to elevate consciousness or to help that consciousness emerge. Yeah. What do you think? Can we do that? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I think we're way on, well on the way. It, it is happening. I, I think, think so we're, 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 uh, we're in this process and it's already happening all across the globe in so many areas. And you, um, at times you need to look uh, beneath the the story that is being run on the surface to see what is truly happening in the world. And I think as soon as you get be, uh, beneath this story, you can find that so much positive things are happening. But of course, it's easy to be caught up in this shallow story that that we're being fed with all the time. Uh, and as long as we stay in that and believe that to be the truth of the world, it's difficult to move forward. But I think more and more people are realizing that this shallow story is not, is not the whole thing, that there's so many layers um, beneath that shallow story that we can delve into and find so much knowledge and consciousness and uh, positive thinking that 
is already evolving and moving, truly moving the planet forward. So I'm very optimistic in this sense that uh, in the knowledge also that there's so much that I still don't know that is happening. Uh, there's so much more to explore. There's always new layers of knowledge waiting for us to discover. Uh, and uh, I think we're just bursting with this new energy uh, in so many different ways that it just wants to, you know, be birthed. <laughs> so I think that's really inspiring for for the future and brings so much hope to us as a species that this we already have this. It's already there. It just hasn't come to the surface yet. Right. But exactly. Well, the thing I love about starting with economy and just facing that head on is I feel like that's the thing that feels like the densest energy for a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it's the thing that, oh, I want to be spiritual, but I need to do this or that. So I just feel like by confronting that, but, you know, that, that out that people cut out for themselves, you know, it's just, it's a reality. I mean, we all need to pay our bills. And so I think if we can just look at treating, you know, our relationship with money in a little bit more light and playful and curious way, you know, for me, that's been helpful to just get out of the, the business as usual model and to explore mm -hmm. how it could work, you know. But I'm curious, like, for somebody that would be listening and just saying like, oh, you know, but I have to do this, I have to do that. I mean, how did you kind of uncouple yourself from the way things are? I mean, what was your first step toward just being able to look at the economy differently and for living into that? Oh, that, that was a real tricky question to me. I'm, I'm not quite sure where it started because for as long as I remember, I've been questioning the current system. So I've been, some, in, some part of me has always been very skeptic, like it's n not believing in this story. So, uh, so I think it kind of has come naturally to me uh, to step into this. But of course, there's always obstacles when you try to move in a different direction. And of course, there are things happening within you. And parts of me, of course, one has, when I was younger, of course, wanted to adapt. And that's a natural thing to, to realize that we want to adapt to the current reality. At the same time, I think it's, I think in our time, Many of us uh, think of, uh, of the current reality as quite solid, whereas it was less solid maybe in the 60s and the 70s when, when more people were believing in a sense that we could change the world. So I'm, I think it's very important to remember that the world isn't as solid as it looks. And this also comes to, of course, in a very great sense to, to e your personal economy and how, how you can look upon that. So uh, I think just applying this softness is something that brings uh, a new energy to very many fields. And as you can do that and play with it, as you say also, uh, it brings in a new energy and then, uh, after what seemed to be very solid at times, uh, turns out to be not that solid. And, and I think a great example of that would be like if you have $20 or any amount, but just say $20, at times you can feel this amount of money would suffice for a long time. Whereas at times it seems like they just disappear. So even though we think we can measure the amount of money, when, it, when we look at our own economy from this perspective, it turns out that they're not always the same. The money isn't the same at all times. Uh, at times they, they last forever, and at times they just, you know, 
run through your fingers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this is an important aspect to remember that we, even though we think we can measure things, they're not solid just because we've measured them. So uh, I think that's a very, can be a very good starting point because uh, we're so used to this measuring and the measuring in itself is also what's taking all the way, uh, at times is what taking the energy out of things uh, because we don't, we just appreciate things for the numbers and not for what they bring. And the same comes with money. Like if we truly appreciate what we can do with our money, then we also become more grateful for the money that we have. And then it's easier, so much easier than to feel the abundance. And, and that also brings us in a sense more, then it's easier to attract more money to the things that we really want to do. And I stress this really because there's so much uh, information out there saying that, well, you know, you should have this, you should have that. But that's maybe not what your soul is desiring. So we need to remember what, what is it that my soul truly desires. And when we're aligned with that and stop counting how much is needed, then uh, suddenly we will just have the resources that's needed when we dare to trust that and have faith in what's developing. I love that. Well, that, that was what was coming up for me too, was gratitude. You know, I think being grateful for what you already have somehow energetically unlocks the ability for spirit or whatever you want to call it, you know, to work through you. It's like, well, why, why would the universe grant more of something if, if you weren't even grateful for what you had already, you know, because yeah. what do they say? There's always somebody richer, thinner, <laughs> that kind of thing. So yeah, there will always be somebody with more, but starting with the appreciation of what you have and, yeah. and just building on that, that foundation is great. That's wonderful. And, and, I, and I think it's very easy. Also, if, if you look at how you relate to other people, if you give someone something and, and they're not very grateful, you're not that prone to give them more. But if they're truly grateful, then you feel, then you start feeling more generous towards these people as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also how I think in, to a large extent, the, the, inner, the universe is working. As we're grateful, we're getting more. And and then it's very and when you look at it from this personal perspective, it's very easy to understand how this process works. Just this knowledge of how easy it is to give to someone who's truly grateful, and the same goes for us. The universe it's easier for the universe to give to us if we're if we're truly grateful. Well, for a time I had studied um, Kabbalah. I don't know if you've ever gotten much into that, but. I really thought it was interesting that the word actually means to receive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's kind of like if that's the other thing too, is that you need to be willing to receive. If you go around in the world and just say, Oh, woe is me. Nothing good ever happens. That's like another sign to the universe that like, you're not actually ready to receive, you know, it, it's almost like an electrical current. It's always there, but you have to take the action to turn on, the light switch, you know, to yeah. activate that current and to, yeah. to receive, you know, the current. Yeah. And so that, that's just kind of another thing that's helped me too, is to take the mindset out of, you know, I'm doing it all. And as you mentioned before, that ego self, but if I'm co-creating abundance and I'm trying to, if I want to attract resources into my life, not for myself alone, but to truly do something, you know, bigger for the world or for my community or even, you know, my family or something like that. Is that something that you've noticed? I, I just feel like that attracts a different energy and different resources than when it's an ego, you know, I want for me. Yeah, of course. Uh, and, and usually this I want for me is not truly your soul desires e either. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and of course, so yeah, of course, I also find it much easier if there's like a bigger cause to what you're working with, 
and then it's so much easier of course to attract the resources uh, than if it's just you know i would want a new television set <laughs> that's not that easy to find the resources for but on the on the other hand uh, as there's surplus right now of money so in our modern economy at times it's also very easy to be of course be swamped by stuff right <laughs> because so many people have so much money to buy so many things that they don't need and then you get uh, then you get uh, a stranglehold from from that instead and uh, so I th and I think so. There's so many people now that are working, you know, just to clear out what's not supposed to be there. So it, this is, and in this way, it's um, it's in a sense it has become more difficult in this way to to talk about abundance because we have to talk about abundance from this almost spiritual level that we that it's our souls desires that and abundance in relation to that instead mm -hmm. of this uh, swamping of uh, products from from uh, that are coming to us so easily so uh, so that's that's an important thing right now and also of course from a sustainability perspective it's very important that we really find what we truly need and want instead of having all these things that really doesn't give us anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how do you personally tune in to make sure that you are, you know, listening to your true soul's desire? Is there any tip or method or just a practice that you, you use to make sure you're in alignment or do you just know uh, I couldn't say that there's practice through it. Mm -hmm. uh, more of this knowledge and always checking with myself, is this something that I really want or is it something that my ego is just yearning for at this time? Uh, and I think as this process has developed and evolved, it's like... Uh, I'm not that interested anymore in the things that don't bring me true abundance. So I think that's a, a, a reprogramming also of, you know, of the way of my way of being that uh, I don't care if I have the latest phone anymore or if I have mm -hmm. a fancy car or these things, but, but the things that I truly need to sustain myself, these, these are, becoming more important but then on the other hand then also what comes up to, for me is that it's more of the relations the relationships that brings more quality than uh, than anything you could buy and then of course that doesn't require any resources but it's a change of focus just focusing on the people you truly love and who are important in your life. Well, it does require the resource of time, you know, and well, yeah, that's true. But the that's, investment yeah, of time, and sometimes that's more valuable than anything that people could pay for. But it's it's not, you know, usually valued for what it is, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, cool. Well, that's probably why I'm so very into time banking, but that, that could be a different show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't recall if you said you've ever been, have you been involved in that at all in Sweden? Not, not specifically in time banking, but I've been mm -hmm. involved in LETS circles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and right. they're pretty similar. It's just you know, how you measure things that differ. So, so I, I know, I, I know the thought behind it. Right. And tell me again what LETS stands for. I know I've seen this before, uh, but I can't. It's local exchange and trading systems. Right. Okay. Thank so you. and and there, from what I know, there are so many LETS systems around the globe that are up and running. 
Uh, it's just thousands of these systems around the globe that are actually already working. And, and they're not gaining that much attention, of course, because many people believe that we only have this one kind of currency that we're used to. Uh, and and it's, it's a pity because I think uh, these system really can show, systems can show the way mm -hmm. how we can move into a society that's much more sustainable. But I cause, of course, that's something you've probably experienced a lot in your time banking as well. Yeah, I kind of have a crazy goal to just, um, you know, sometimes people say like, oh, who cares what you had for lunch or what you, you had for dinner, you know, kind of showing off in an ego sort of way on social media. But I, I like to showcase what I'm doing with things that are paid for by time banking, because I think that does get people to say like, wait, how did you do that? You know, how are, how are, yeah. what, the cost was zero? <laughs> like, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, that makes people like stop and think, wait a minute, you know, why am I working so hard to get money to turn around and buy the thing that this woman's just getting for time, you know, and. So that, that's kind of one of the things I hope to accomplish through the show too, is just, you know, let's talk to people who are doing that. And then, you know, maybe that part of the ego self that still wants, you know, that, that'll catch them enough to try it. And then once you try it, it unlocks, you know, all these other riches that you didn't even expect. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I love too that you said you're so curious and, you know, there's still so much to know. So I, I would like to end our talk with two big questions. So you've got as much time as you'd like for both of these, but this is where I'm going is what, what currently excites you, you know, what's working well that you're, you're utilizing and you're, you know, actively doing in your life, you know, now, and then also what are the things that you're curious about? You know, what do you not know yet, but you have just heard about, or you've begun to be curious about and begun to know. Mm. Oh, those were difficult questions because I usually have very many simultaneous projects and thoughts processes going on at the same time. And you can come back and we can do this again. So it's, it's just a static <laughs> shot in time yeah. with today. Yeah, sure. It doesn't have to be but, for the rest of your life. Uh, no, but uh, I'm just trying to figure out mm -hmm. what's, uh, t what's, uh, what's there for me right now. And <laughs> well, actually, to me right now, what is most important, I think, is to find inner peace. Because through my life, I haven't really found that uh, within myself truly and sustainably. Because I've been, you know, kind of worried at times. And uh, so I, I would need this energy of uh, really be grounded. And to me, this program from with the ambassadors has has brought this energy to to focus on grounding 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 and i think also as an ambassador what humanity needs at the present is being at peace if we would all be at peace there would of course we'd be no more for instance so I think it's an important lesson for me as an ambassador too to find this inner peace because otherwise I can't really truly be this ambassador that I want to be. Uh, so I need to step into this way of being, being in total peace and po total faith. Uh, and uh, yeah, and explore that more. That's what's that's what's driving me at the moment. Uh, and in a way that's also letting go of so much because if you find an inner peace, you need to relax into that peace. And I think so much of what we're doing in the world currently is to strive. We're striving to succeed. We're striving to do a lot of things. and. Uh, if we look around, we can see that it's not really working that well. Uh, and I think uh, uh, 
an author that is, has caught my attention recently, uh, right now very much is, is Charles Eisenstein, and he's talking very much about this, how, how we need to find this peace, uh, this inner peace, and how society, we can't go on. For instance, we can't have a war on climate change. Uh, and uh, we're so much used to this way of being that we're against different things. Uh, and it's not a really great energy if you truly want to accomplish something new. So, so this is where, that's also where my inner guidance currently is leading me is towards this searching for this inner peace and to really ground that and root that within myself. Uh, and also then from, as we have, having gone through this program with so much energy uh, in it, and then to try to bring that all down within myself to really ground that. And, and I've realized I need to work. It, you can, I can't do that in two or three weeks. It takes a lot more time to, to digest that. So, uh, yeah, so, so this is where I'm heading at the moment. Oh, I love but, that. Well, I'm curious because I am a huge fan of Charles Eisenstein as well. I, I think you and I talked about the book, Sacred Economics. Yes. I recall we talked about that. Yeah. And then the, the book or the climate change reference, was that something that Charles Eisenstein also talked about? Yes, it is. It is. Uh, was that in Ascent of Humanity by any chance, or was that a different book? He has a new book out right now. I think it's called uh, uh, Climate Change, A New Story, I think it's called. Okay. Uh, I haven't read that yet. That is going on the reading list. <laughs> yeah. And I it's do... also available online, so you could read it for free oh, if you want to. Great. And I also want to tell you, oh, maybe I don't have it right here. I take it very seriously when people refer me to books. And I, I also purchased the book that you mentioned. Um, gosh, I don't have it right here. It was something like a new, new economic or new money for a new time. Yeah, new money for a new world. New world, that's it. Okay, so yeah. I just got that. I haven't gotten a chance to dig into it yet. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I have several books like all around me at all times, but I just think telling people what are about our own books is great. Um, if you don't mind, I'm also going to say just really quickly, because I had yours truly had a book that came out on May 29th. And I don't even know if I shared with you my chapter. If anybody has gotten to this part of the listening, I just want you to know you can click on the link I'll put in the show notes and you don't have to buy my book. I'll be happy to just send you the um, e-copy of my chapter alone but my, my chapter in this book talks about, it's called Remembering Eden, Discovering uh -huh. Communities Hidden Assets uh -huh. or Hidden Treasures. And it was like remembering, you know, getting the members back to Eden. Because if, I felt like if we all work together and basically we already have what we need to live in abundance, but it requires the cooperation. And so yeah. I do talk about some of the things that we've been talking about and it ends with talking about the ambassador program, but it was before Barbara passed. So I didn't have a chance to really give that completion. But anyway, I would love to share what I wrote there. It's elements of what we've talked about here. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And so I love that you're just curious and you're going to follow, you know, whatever <laughs> seems to support your soul's vision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. That's really cool. And then I also want to give plenty of time for you to tell listeners, I mean, how can people contact you if they want to learn about your programs? You know, your book will be coming soon, whenever that's available in English, I'll update the show notes and we'll, we'll put that in right now. The book is available only in, in Swedish. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. Right. And people can get that. If you happen to speak Swedish, <laughs> you, <laughs> sure, can, uh, yeah. you can go to just... your, your website, right? Yeah. Or they could just send me an email. So you could just put a put my email in the notes and we will okay. sort that out. No problem. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And do you want to talk at all about the types of programs that you and your wife develop? Or well, those? Uh, 
Only yeah, in that, person or are some of them online as well? No, they're only in person actually, at least so far. So, um, but the goal of our way of working is, is to work with spirit and work with personality hand in hand so that you don't run ahead of yourself on, on just one, on a one-legged journey. Because I think it's very, it's very common that you find so much spiritual uh, information or, you know, you're just being filled with the spiritual energy and moving forward. And at times you forget to bring the whole of you with you. Uh, and if you do that, it's very easy to run faster than you, than your feet can, can carry you. So, uh, so therefore, it's very important that spiritual development also uh, encompasses your personal development. Uh, so this is what we've been very keen on working with when we, when we have our classes. Uh, and it builds a very solid foundation for your personal growth. Uh, because in my experience, many, many spiritual classes uh, are heading for, uh, you know, a kick that you want to be high for a while. And then you return to reality and you fall down again. And uh, that's not very sustainable. So it's important to find ways that you can work with your personality and, and spirit in, in your everyday life. Uh, and just letting spirit lead you in, in your personal development and letting it work with all of you and not just the spiritual part of you. So this, I find that a very important part of, of how we're working. Well, I love so. that you bring that groundedness and sustainability, it sounds like, into all aspects of your life or yeah. you know, as, as many as possible. Yeah, that's true, actually. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know you would like to come back in another time and you can tell us about your very sustainable summer home. So yeah. I would love, would love to do that. I think that would be its own great separate conversation and maybe maybe you can even do it you know, from that location, which would be yes. fun. But yes. Robert, I really appreciate you being with me today and sharing these resources and really want to invite you back because I feel like um, one of my teachers, John Young, he, he studied with a Kalahari Bushman. I can't remember <laughs> if I told you this before. No, it, yeah, I don't think you did. But no? Yeah. Okay. They have something that they call building the ropes. So mm -hmm. if you have one conversation thread or the first time you see a tree and you're like, hmm, I wonder what that tree is, or you identify it. But it's just a thin thread. But then the next time you go back and you see that tree again, or you see that friend again, or you have that conversation again, you build that thread thicker and thicker. And then they say, we're building ropes, you know, so that's yeah. how they know their natural surroundings so well as they take the time to build the ropes. So right now, we've got one recorded conversation, you know, on the books. <laughs> As we, you know, spider web out and connect the dots with our own, you know, resources and connections. And, you know, I, I think we've talked about our, our friend Cindy, who's in the ambassador program as well. She's really got like a producer's mindset and she sees us, you know, all having little pods of shows and being interconnected. And I think that would just be great. So if we can keep building the ropes, you know, the two of us, but also within our networks and, you know, bringing more people into it, that, that would be lovely. So I think for my own call to action, what I'm going to ask is that if you've heard the show and you think, oh, um, I wonder if these people know about this book or this resource, please leave it in the comments below. Or you can email me, Kathy, K-A-T-H-Y, at cothrive.org. Or you can visit the website at cothrive.org and sign up for the email list to get notified about you know, future episodes. You can find me pretty much online on every platform at Kathy Sipple. And uh, you can talk to me that way as well. But Robert, thank you for being here today. And anything else, parting thoughts that you'd like to share? 
No, I, I think I feel complete right now. It's just been a pleasure to be in this show with you and I look forward to our next conversation. Just great. Thank you very much. Sounds really great. Thank you.